Book Three, Chapters Four through Six of The Wars of the Jews. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wars of the Jews by Josephus, translated by William Whiston. Book Three, Chapters Four through Six. Chapter Four. Josephus makes an attempt upon Sephorus, but is repelled. Titus comes with a great army to Ptolemaeus. Now the auxiliaries, which were sent to assist the people of Sepporus, being a thousand horsemen and six thousand footmen, under Placidus the Tribune, pitched their camp in two bodies on the great plain. The foot were put into the city to be a guard to it, but the horse lodged abroad in the camp. These last, by marching continually one way or the other, and overrunning the parts of the adjoining country, were very troublesome to Josephus and his men. They also plundered all the places that were out of the city's liberty, and intercepted such as durst go abroad. On this account it was that Josephus marched against the city, as hoping to take that which he had lately encompassed with so strong a wall, before they revolted from the rest of the Galileans, that the Romans would have much ado to take it, by which means he proved too weak, and failed of his hopes both as to the forcing the place, and as to his prevailing with the people of Sephorus to deliver it up to him. By this means he provoked the Romans to treat the country according to the law of war. Nor did the Romans, out of the anger they bore at this attempt, leave off, either by night or by day, burning the places in the plain, and stealing away the cattle that were in the country, and killing whatsoever appeared capable of fighting perpetually, and leading the weaker people as slaves into captivity, so that Galilee was all over filled with fire and blood, nor was it exempted from any kind of misery or calamity, for the only refuge they had was this, that when they were pursued they could retire to the cities which had walls built to them by Josephus. But as to Titus, he sailed over from Achaia to Alexandria, and that sooner than the winter season did usually permit. So he took with him those forces he was sent for, and marching with great expedition, he came suddenly to Ptolemaeus, and there finding his father, together with the two legions, the fifth and the tenth, which were the most eminent legions of all, he joined them to that fifteenth legion, which was with his father. Eighteen cohorts followed these legions. There came also five cohorts from Caesarea, with one troop of horsemen, and five other troops of horsemen from Syria. Now these ten cohorts had severally a thousand footmen, but the other thirteen cohorts had no more than six hundred footmen apiece, with a hundred and twenty horsemen. There were also a considerable number of auxiliaries got together, that came from the kings Antiochus and Agrippa, and Sahemus, each of them contributing one thousand footmen that were archers, and a thousand horsemen. Malchus also, the king of Arabia, sent a thousand horsemen, besides five thousand footmen, the greatest part of which were archers, so that the whole army, including the auxiliaries sent by the kings, as well as horsemen and footmen, when all were united together, amounted to sixty thousand, besides the servants, who, as they followed in vast numbers, so became that they had been trained up in war with the rest, ought not to be distinguished from the fighting men. For as they were in their master's service in times of peace, so did they undergo the like dangers with them in times of war, insomuch that they were inferior to none, either in skill or in strength, only they were subject to their masters. Chapter 5. A Description of the Roman Armies and Roman Camps, and of other particulars for which the Romans are commended. Now here one cannot but admire the precaution of the Romans, in providing themselves of such household servants as might not only serve at other times for the common offices of life, but might also be of advantage to them in their wars. And indeed, if any one does but attend to the other parts of their military discipline, he will be forced to confess that their obtaining so large a dominion hath been the acquisition of their valor, and not the bare gift of fortune. For they do not begin to use their weapons first in time of war, nor do they then put their hands first into motion, while they avoided so to do in times of peace. But as if their weapons did always cling to them, they have never had any truce from warlike exercises, 
nor do they stay till times of war admonish them to use them. For their military exercises differ not at all from the real use of arms, but every soldier is every day exercised, and that with great diligence, as if it were in time of war, which is the reason why they bear the fatigue of battle so easily. For neither can disorder remove them from their usual regularity, nor can fear affright them out of it, nor can labor tire them. Which firmness of conduct makes them always to overcome those that have not the same firmness? Nor would he be mistaken that should call those their exercises unbloody battles, and their battles bloody exercises. Nor can their enemies easily surprise them with the suddenness of their incursions, for as soon as they have marched into an enemy's land, they do not begin to fight till they have walled their camp about. Nor is the fence they raise rashly made or uneven, nor do they all abide ill it, nor do those that are in it take their places at random. But if it happens that the ground is uneven, it is first leveled. Their camp is also four square by measure, and carpenters are ready in great numbers with their tools to erect buildings for them. Footnote. This description of the exact symmetry and regularity of the Roman army and of the Roman encampments with their surrounding trumpets, etc., and order of war described in this and the next chapter is so very like to the symmetry and regularity of the people of Israel in the wilderness that one cannot well avoid the supposal that the one was the ultimate pattern of the other, and that the tactics of the ancients were taken from the rules given by God to Moses. And it is thought by some skillful in these matters that these accounts of Josephus, as to the Roman camp and armor, and conduct in war, are preferable to those in the Roman authors themselves. End footnote. As for what is within the camp, it is set apart for tents, but the outward circumference hath the resemblance to a wall, and it is adorned with towers at equal distances, where between the towers stand the engines for throwing arrows and darts, and for slinging stones, and where they lay all other engines that can annoy the enemy, all ready for their several operations. They also erect four gates, one at every side of the circumference, and those large enough for the entrance of the beasts, and wide enough for making excursions, if the occasion should require. They divide the camp within into streets, very conveniently, and place the tents of the commanders in the middle. But in the very midst of all is the general's own tent, in the nature of a temple, insomuch that it appears to be a city built on the sudden, with its marketplace and place for handicraft trades, and with seats for the officers superior and inferior, where, if any differences arise, their causes are heard and determined. The camp, and all that is in it, is encompassed with a wall round about, and that sooner than one would imagine, and this by the multitude and the skill of the laborers, and if occasion require, a trench is drawn round the hole, whose depth is four cubits, and its breadth equal. When they have thus secured themselves, they live together by companies, with quietness and decency, as are all their other affairs managed with good order and security. Each company hath also their wood, and their corn, and their water brought to them, when they stand in need of them, for they neither sup nor dine, as they please themselves singly, but all together. Their times also for sleeping and watching and rising are notified beforehand by the sound of trumpets. Nor is anything done without such a signal. And in the morning the soldiery go every one to their centurions, and these centurions to their tribunes to salute them, with whom all the superior officers go to the general of the whole army, who then gives them, of course, the watchword and the other orders to be by them cared to all that are under their command, which is also observed when they go to fight, and thereby when they turn themselves about on the sudden, when there is occasion for making sallies, as they come back when they are recalled in crowds also. Now when they are to go out of their camp, a trumpet gives a sound, at which time nobody lies still, but at the first intimation they take down their tents, and all is made ready for their going out, then do the trumpets sound again, to order them to get ready for the march. Then do they lay their baggage suddenly upon their mules and other beasts of burden, and stand, as at the place of starting, ready to march. When also they set fire to their camp, 
and this they do because it will be easy for them to erect another camp, and that it may never be of use to their enemies. Then do the trumpets give a sound the third time, that they are to go out, in order to excite those that on any account are a little tardy, so that no one may be out of his rank when the army marches. Then does the crier stand at the general's right hand, and ask them thrice, in their own tongue, whether they be ready to go to war or not. To which they reply as often, with a loud and cheerful voice, saying, We are ready. And this they do almost before the question is asked them. They do this as filled with a kind of martial fury, and at the same time they so cry out, they lift up their right hands also. When, after this, they are gone out of their camp, they all march without noise, and in a decent manner, and every one keeps his own rank, as if they are going to war. The footmen are armed with breastplates and headpieces, and have swords on each side. But the sword which is upon their left side is much longer than the other, for that on the right side is not longer than a span. Those footmen also that are chosen from out the best to be about the general himself have a lance and a buckler. But the rest of the foot soldiers have a spear and a long buckler, besides a saw and a basket, a pickaxe and an axe, a thong of leather, and a hook, with provisions for three days, so that a footman hath no great need of a mule to carry his burdens. The horsemen have a long sword on their right sides, axed a long pole in their hand. A shield also lies by them obliquely on one side of their horses, with three or more darts that are borne in their quiver having broad points, and not smaller than spears. They have also headpieces and breastplates, in like manner as have all the footmen. And for those that are chosen to be about the general, their armor in no way differs from that of the horsemen belonging to other troops, and he always leads the legions forth to whom the lot assigns that employment. This is the manner of marching and resting of the Romans, as also those are the several sorts of weapons they use. But when they are to fight, they leave nothing without forecast, nor to be done offhand. But counsel is ever first taken before any work is begun, and what hath been there resolved upon is put into execution presently, for which reason they seldom commit any errors. And if they have been mistaken at any time, they easily correct those mistakes. They also esteem any errors they commit upon taking counsel beforehand to be better than such rash success as is owing to fortune only, because such a fortuitous advantage tempts them to be inconsiderate, while consultation, though it may sometimes fail of success, hath this good in it, that it makes men more careful hereafter. But for the advantages that arise from chance, they are not owing to him that gains them. And as to what melancholy accidents happen unexpectedly, there is this comfort in them, that they had, however, taken the best consultations they could to prevent them. Now they so manage their preparatory exercises of their weapons, that not the bodies of soldiers only, but their souls may also become stronger. They are, moreover, hardened for war by fear, for their laws inflict capital punishments, not only for soldiers running away from the ranks, but for slothfulness and inactivity, though it be but in a lesser degree, as are their generals more severe than their laws, for they prevent any imputation of cruelty toward those under condemnation by the great rewards they bestow on the valiant soldiers. And the readiness of obeying their commanders is so great that it is very ornamental in peace, but when they come to a battle the whole army is but one body. So well coupled together are their ranks, so sudden are their turnings about, so sharp their hearing as to what orders are given them, so quick their sight of the ensigns, and so nimble are their hands when they set to work. Whereby it comes to pass that what they do is done quickly, and what they suffer they bear with the greatest patience. Nor can we find any examples where they have been conquered in battle when they came to a close fight, either by the multitude of the enemies, or by stratagems, or by the difficulties in the places they were in, no, nor by fortune neither, for their victories have been surer to them than fortune could have granted them. In a case, therefore, where counsel still goes before action, and where, after taking the best advice, that advice is followed by so active an army, 
What wonder is it that Euphrates on the east, the ocean on the west, the most fertile regions of Libya on the south, and the Danube and the Rhine on the north are the limits of this empire? One might well say that the Roman possessions are not inferior to the Romans themselves. This account I have given the reader, not so much with the intention of commending the Romans, as of comforting those that have been conquered by them, and for the deterring others from attempting innovations under their government. This discourse of the Roman military conduct may also perhaps be of use to such of the curious as are ignorant of it, and yet have a mind to know it. I return now from this digression. Chapter 6 Placidus attempts to take Jatapata and is beaten off. Vespasian marches into Galilee. And now Vespasian, with his son Titus, had tarried some time at Ptolemaeus, and had put his army in order. But when Placidus, who had overrun Galilee, and had besides slain a number of those whom he had caught, which were only the weaker part of the Galileans, and such as were of timorous souls, saw that the warriors ran always to those cities with walls that had been built by Josephus, he marched furiously against Jatapata, which was of them all the strongest, as supposing he should easily take it by a sudden surprise, and that he should thereby obtain great honor to himself among the commanders, and bring a great advantage to them in their future campaign, because if the strongest place of them all were once taken, the rest would be so affrighted as to surrender themselves. But he was mightily mistaken in his undertaking, for the men of Jotapata were apprised of his coming to attack them, and came out of the city and expected him there. So they fought the Romans briskly when they least expected it, being both many in number and prepared for fighting, and of great alacrity, as esteeming their country, their wives, and their children to be in danger, and easily put the Romans to flight, and wounded many of them, and slew seven of them. Footnote, I can but here observe an eastern way of speaking, frequent among them, but not usual among us, where the word only or alone is not set down, but perhaps some way supplied in the pronunciation. Thus Josephus here says that those of Jatapata slew seven of the Romans as they were marching off, because the Romans' retreat was regular, their bodies were covered with their armor, and the Jews fought at some distance. His meaning is clear, that these were the reasons why they slew only or no more than seven. I have met with many like examples in the scriptures, in Josephus, etc., but did not note down the particular places. This observation ought to be borne in mind on many occasions. End footnote. Because their retreat was not made in a disorderly manner, because the strokes only touched the surface of their bodies, which were covered with their armor in all parts, and because the Jews did rather throw their weapons upon them from a great distance, than venture to come hand to hand with them, and had only light armor on, while the others were completely armored. However, three men of the Jews' side were slain, and a few wounded. So Placidus, finding himself unable to assault the city, ran away. But as Vespasian had a great mind to fall upon Galilee, he marched out of Ptolemaeus, having put his army into that order wherein the Romans used to march. He ordered those auxiliaries which were lightly armed, and the archers, to march first, that they might prevent any sudden insults from the enemy, and might search out the woods that looked suspiciously and were capable of ambuscades. Next to these followed that part of the Romans which was completely armed, both footmen and horsemen. Next to these followed ten of every hundred, carrying along with them their arms, and what was necessary to measure out a camp withal, and after them such as were to make the road even and straight, and if it were anywhere rough and hard to be passed over, to plane it, and to cut down the woods that hindered their march, that the army might not be in distress, or tired with their march. Behind these he set such carriages of the army, as belonged both to himself and to the other commanders, with a considerable number of their horsemen for their security. After these he marched himself, having with him a select body of footmen, and horsemen, and pikemen. After these came the peculiar cavalry of his own legion, for there were a hundred and twenty horsemen that peculiarly belonged to every legion. Next to these came the mules that carried the engines for sieges, and the other warlike machines of that nature. After these came the commanders of the cohorts and tribunes, 
having about them soldiers chosen out of the rest. Then came the ensigns encompassing the eagle, which is at the head of every Roman legion, the king and the strongest of all birds, which seems to them a signal of dominion, and an omen that they shall conquer all against whom they march. These sacred ensigns are followed by the trumpeters. Then came the main army in their squadrons and battalions, with six men in depth, which were followed at last by a centurion, who, according to custom, observed the rest. As for the servants of every legion, they all followed the footmen, and led the baggage of the soldiers, which was borne by the mules and other beasts of burden. But behind all the legions came the whole multitude of the mercenaries, and those that brought up the rear came last of all for the security of the whole army, being both footmen, and those in their armor also, with a great number of horsemen. And thus did Vespasian march with his army, and came to the bounds of Galilee, where he pitched his camp, and restrained his soldiers, who were eager for war. He also showed his army to the enemy, in order to affright them, and to afford them a season for repentance, to see whether they would change their minds before it came to battle. And at the same time he got things ready for besieging their strong minds. And indeed this sight of the general brought many to repent of their revolt, and put them all into a consternation. For those that were in Josephus's camp, which was at the city called Garrus, not far from Sepphoris, when they heard that the war was come near them, and that the Romans would suddenly fight them hand to hand, dispersed themselves and fled, not only before they came to a battle, but before the enemy ever came in sight, while Josephus and a few others were left behind. And as he saw that he had not an army sufficient to engage the enemy, that the spirits of the Jews were sunk, and that the greater part would willingly come to terms, if they might be credited, he already despaired of the success of the whole war, and determined to get as far as he possibly could out of danger. So he took those that stayed among with him, and fled to Tiberias. End of Book 3, Chapters 4 through 6